church family. I have the privilege of overseeing outreach and adult ministries here at the church. We all have our part of the picture, but we don't always get to see the whole picture. I want to take a moment to share this piece of the picture that I get to see regularly. Your investment at Motion Church goes to support these amazing ministries. Let me take a minute to share the good that these ministries do. Meals in Motion, for example, feeds hundreds of families every month, and last year over 2,200 families were served through this ministry. Celebrate Recovery has over 200 people every Friday night working through all kinds of hurts, habits, and hangups, and finding freedom, including kids. People give their lives to Jesus every weekend at Celebrate Recovery. Divorce care over the last few years has helped hundreds of individuals navigate the pain of divorce in a safe, grace-filled place. Now we have divorce care for kids as well here at the church. Financial Peace University over the last few years has also helped literally hundreds of couples and families and individuals find and live in financial freedom. Family Meal Night, for example, feeds approximately 50 families dinner once a month on Thursday nights. And finally, there's Hope in Motion, the backpack school event we just had uh, in August. That literally provided backpacks and school supplies and food through Meals in Motion for nearly 1,500 kids in our community. These are real lives and real families who are being directly, practically ministered to, needs being met, and bringing the gospel of Jesus directly into their lives through our work here collectively as a church. It's been amazing to see how much our community has been affected by our church, but also the entire globe. Our influence has been able to travel all throughout the world with our Ministry Institute program, where they go on mission trips every single year. We've been able to feed the homeless. We've been able to do street evangelism, teaching people about Jesus. We've built a, a walkway so that people don't have to walk through six inches of mud to get into church. And just this last year, we went to Peru, and there was a woman that lost her whole family in a house fire, and we got to rebuild her house for her and share the hope of Jesus with her. Our church has produced so many great leaders. In fact, there have been so many churches planted in our country just because of them. And not only that, but our students are the ones staffing these churches and other churches around our area. It's not just in the church world, but we've also seen a great recognition in our business community from the people that have come from this house. Ultimately, we're excited about the leaders that have come from this house, but we're also excited about the ones that are currently here and the stories that they'll get to tell. chair there we go good to see you guys <laughs> and good at <laughs> <laughs> we're so glad at puyallup campus you're with us you're live we love you we love our hey can you give a lot of love to our downtown campus so glad you guys are with us in downtown puyallup glad you're here on south hill and those that are online as well um what we have is a great opportunity to do something it's kind of one of those once in a lifetime type moments and what I want, what we, what I want to do is, first of all, is introduce this beautiful young lady to you. Her name is Brittany McCartan, and this is our Bonnie Lake campus pastor, and she's crushing it in Bonnie Lake. Everybody sees her coming; they all know what's coming. Do they don't duck too much? Not too often, I don't think. No, they not get anymore. They get excited. <laughs> we're building a campus. Um, we're building a campus in Bonnie Lake. And so we've been, we've been meeting with the county, we've been raising money, and uh, we're all bringing our cards next week. But I thought it'd be kind of cool if you guys got to hear a story or two uh, of people that are involved with Take the Hill. Brittany, why don't you tell a story or two? It has been really amazing. And you know, we just want to say thank you to you guys. Maybe it's a campus that you'll never even set foot in, but our campus is so blessed by your step of faith, and I know that God's going to pour into you as you sow seed into a city and into a place that God is going to really move and work, and there's a couple end of the spectrum with Take the Hill, and um, it's been amazing, even just this week, if you've been catching in your devotions in the book of Mark, we just read about the woman that bring uh, one penny, two mites, right, and how much that how much pride that brought the Lord. And, and, and then there's people that are able to give out of this abundance. And on every end of it, it just blesses the Lord. And we have one guy in our campus who took this initiative to, he's a single young guy and wants to give and be a part of Take the Hill and felt this challenged by the Holy Spirit and doesn't have the finances, looks at his bank account, doesn't have it, yet feels this stir in him to give. So what he's actually doing is taking this booklet that's on your seats at every campus to doors next to these neighborhoods and is knocking on the door saying, hi, I just wanted to let you know 
Um, I'm from Motion Church. We're building a campus in Bonnie Lake, and we just want to be a part of this community. Can I, can I rake the leaves in your lawn for you? And if you feel led to give a donation, wow. feel free. If not, no worries. Wow. I'm here anyways. And this man is giving out of that place. So it's really cool. Then you have the other end. I have another family at our campus who's, because we had the advanced commitment night. So next weekend's going to be really powerful when we all get to do this together. But we have some families that have already started giving. And this one family felt led in their heart to give a percentage of the business sales that they, that they work in. And as soon as they made this commitment, they wrote not a number but a percentage of what their business is going to bring in. And in two years... This is the most they've ever brought in by 25%. Wow. And then after they gave, we're left over with thousands and thousands of dollars that they don't know where it came from. And so just on every end, the Lord is so good to bless as we give. And so just wanted to share those things with you guys. Um, as Take the Hill is coming, that we're going to do this and we're going to do it together. And God's going to multiply your gift in a big way. So. Yeah. And I, I, I want to brag on Alex and Faith. Alex and Faith are downtown at, at North. Alex, and, he has a great big bushy beard. He looks like a lumberjack. Um, they have five kids and Alex is only 30. Church growth, keep going. Um, they have an eight-year-old son named Charlie. Charlie heard the Take the Hill campaign. And he said, you know what I'm going to do, Dad? I'm going to set up a hot chocolate stand in front of the the, the fire department and raise money for Take the Hill so we can get this building built at age eight. Uh, yeah, he got rejected. They wouldn't let him have a, a hot cocoa stand. So you think like an eight-year-old that just crushed him like a paper cup. He goes, I'll just find someplace else. So he started making all these signs and found a business that would let him uh, front it there. And two weeks, hot cocoa stand goes in place. Eight-year-old Charlie is going to be bringing pennies, nickels, dimes, and quarters from hot chocolate for Take the Hill. And then the, the, the last story I'll tell you is a, is a family that's, that lives, that goes to the downtown campus, Julian, down your campus. And uh, this couple came to me and they just said, you know what? We will never attend that campus. But here's what we know, that God, God had someone else help build this campus and our family is at home here. We're going to help take the hill and build that campus. We're going to give $100,000 and believe that God will help us double it in our business so we can take the hill for Jesus. So isn't it great that it's not about the amount, it's about the heart. And we're going to take the hill for God's name and get Brittany out of a school and get her into a church building. Excited? So we just met with the county. and I, I know I'm going over my a lot of time, but I, let me confer with myself. Can't I? Yes, I can. Um... I can't do it tomorrow because I'm driving, but tonight is just kind of chill. Don't you love it? Um, there is uh, a distinct possibility that if all the ducks line up properly, we can start pushing dirt uh, on May 15th, which is super exciting and super close. So would you be praying with us and then just get ready for uh, our commitment weekend next weekend when we're just, we're just believing God that 100% of us would help take the hill. Brittany, would you pray for our campaign and ask God to bless our people? God, we just thank you so much that of every moment in the history of time, you birthed us and placed us in Motion Church for such a time as this. God, that you've called us, you've set us apart to stretch us and to use the gifts you've given in our life to change the world of someone around us. And God, I just pray a blessing over this entire church, over Take the Hill. We believe, Lord, that the full $6 million is going to be raised in our house, yep. that you're going to multiply every gift that is given, and you're going to bless every family. God, that as we all do this together, it's 100% of us. God, whether it's $1 or 100 or 100000 it doesn't matter. That, God, we are all in this, catching your vision of what you've called us to do in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Good job, Britt. Proud of you. And she's my daughter, and we're going to have a baby in February. Not, you know. January. Oh, in January. Lord, okay. January. Okay. In January. Uh, hey, are you glad you're at church tonight? I want you to know something downtown in Puyallup. I, I prayed over every seat that you're sitting in, so all the cushies where your tushies are sitting have been blessed. I want you to know this. Every seat that you're sitting on right now at South Hill, every seat has been prayed over. So you just, did you, did you just feel the Holy Spirit? 
you are so good. I'm like, man, that sounds like an angel back there playing. Good job. <laughs> We're continuing our series entitled Set the Edge. And we know that that's a football term. Google it. We're not going to cover the ground again, but we want to set a firm edge. We want to set the edge for God. Because if we set a good edge, nothing can get around us. Don't you know that the devil wants to steal your sexual purity in your dating life? Hey, listen, God wants to steal the sexual purity of your dating life. But if you set a good edge, God will hold you in purity. The, the devil wants to steal, kill, and destroy your marriage. But if you set a good edge, he's going to enable you to have a great marriage. Not a good one, but a great one. If you set a good edge on and on and on in every, in every context of your life, that God will help you do exceedingly and abundantly above and beyond all you could ever expect, think, or even imagine. Are you ready for greatness? If you're ready for greatness, say, I'm ready. ready. Well, tonight we're uh, going to continue this series entitled Set the Edge. And I want to talk to you specifically about a, a word that is very, very significant to setting the edge. And that word is called surrender. I want us to understand what it means to surrender. Now, um, we live in a very, very uh, me-first scenario society. How many of you are aware of that? Have you ever driven in traffic lately? And, and, and have you been there, like, like, like for real, right? And you want to merge, and the person's right next to you going three miles an hour, and they will not make eye contact with you. Like... The eight seconds they're preserving by cutting you off is going to change the trajectory of their universe. I will not look at you. You're over there pretending I don't see you. Me first. Uh, ha have you ever been uh, to Disneyland, anyone? Disneyland? Have you ever seen those line cutters? Now, there are people that have the fast pass. All you need is a baby or a limp and a wheelchair, and you're, and you're good to go. But, but I'm talking about healthy people that say... My time is more important than your time, therefore I will cut the line. And there are people that they have this, 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 like, this way about them, right? They act like they belong, they know someone in front of you, and they just cut right in front. Me first. We live in a very me first society, and it's very me centric. You ever uh, been super hungry at dinner time, and it's kind of like a buffet deal, and someone goes, Yeah, I'm hungrier than you. Wait for me. Me first. I hope I didn't cause family drama in the house tonight. You see, God wants you to be a person of surrender. Now, here's what I believe to be true. I believe that there are many areas of our life where we do a very good job of surrender, right? Now, forgive me, but I'm going to be addressing specifically people that are already in faith that uh, have found Christ. So if you're a seeker of Jesus and not a follower of him, this, this might kind of go above your head and might not feel like it pertains, uh, but it does pertain. There may be areas in your life where surrender is like no problem. Like when it comes to your tithe check, no problem, man. I'm surrendering. When it comes to forgiveness, uh, maybe not so much because you're a pig. And I hope you die or get a bad sickness that leaves you incapacitated, jerk, right? So we, we have these areas of our life where we are great at surrender, but then we might have other areas of our life where we're not so much. Now, in order to live a life of maximized faith, we must live in a paradox to the ways of the world. Now, what does that mean? Live in a paradox. Here's what it means. It means we run to the back of the line so we can be first. That means we give stuff away so we can have more than what we need. That means we surrender so we can be free. All of those don't make sense in a three-dimensional flesh world, but they make perfect sense in the kingdom of God. You see, we need to live in paradox to the world. We need to live in the contrarian side to the world. We need to live opposite to the world. Why? Because this world is not our home. Do you know what this world is? It's a bus stop. This whole thing called life. Let's just say you live 95 years and you're super old. 95. You're gumming your food to death. You're just old. 
Do you know what 95 years is? Watch this. Push in on my face. Camera shot. One shot. Ready for this? Here's 95 years. 95 years. Here's what it is. You know what the Bible says? Our life is a vapor. That's the best way I could describe vapor. All the days of your life are a vapor. Why are we working so hard to build roots here on earth when this is not our home? The Bible tells us that we are strangers and aliens and we are what? Not of this world. Now we're in the world, but not of the world. Right? We live here. Let's not be in a commune and be weirdos. Right? Let's not be those creepy culty people that block everybody else out and like not have buttons on our clothes and wear like weird round hats and, and shoes that don't have lace. I mean, let's not be those people. Come on now. But we live in this world, but we're not of this world. So here's what we must do. No question, we must surrender. Hello, Annie. Welcome to church tonight. So good to see you. In Galatians chapter 2 and verse 20, there's a verse I want us downtown and online. By the way, all, welcome uh, all of you that are living in or watching in Texas, in Hawaii, uh, people that are in South America, people that are uh, up in Canada. Well, could you welcome our online family as well? So glad you guys are here with us on the World Wide Web. I want us to read this verse out loud together. Ready? Here we go. I have been crucified with Christ, and I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. The life I live in the body, I live in faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Do you know where we get hung up in this whole thing called surrender? We live with this misnomer or bad ideology that our life is our own and our body is our own. See, the Bible tells us in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 9, that do you know that your body is not your own? You were bought at a price. What was the price? Well, we did it in communion tonight, right? The blood of the Son of God. This body that I live in is not mine. Therefore, I needed to... Have you ever loaned something out to somebody and have them bring it back wrecked? Right? Like, have you ever, girls, come on now, have you ever loaned a dress or a sweater or a pair of pants to a girl, and she brings it back wadded up with stains on it, and you're thinking, I'm going to kill you, and then pray that God heal you. How about this, guys? You ever loan a tool, and then, like, you haven't gotten it back? <laughs> like, hey, I gave you a hammer, a screwdriver, and a sledgehammer, a tape measure, and, and, and where is it? And then you go into their garage, and their names are, are written over yours. No, no, that's happened. I've done that to a couple guys. So, um, <laughs> I'm sorry, Doily Fulcher. <sighs> but our name's in an ER, so I didn't think Fulcher and Archer would get missed. Um, <laughs> we're not our own. We don't belong to us. Your body is not yours. You didn't pay for it, and you didn't die for it. It was made by God and given to you as a gift. And your days are a gift. And you know what God asked for in return? Surrender. He asked for surrender. Now, uh, like I said, there may be certain areas in your life where surrender is no issue for you. Like when it comes, when it comes time to like, like, like serving, man, you are, the, you are the sacrificial servant, man. And you, you, you just, you... You act before you're asked because you just love to serve. But then if someone offends you and makes you mad, you hold a grudge. Have you ever noticed how boys and girls fight differently? Like if two boys in the third grade get in a fist fight on the playground, they'll smash each other in the face and then have lunch together in the cafeteria. Two girls get in a cat fight, pull each other's hair and gouge their face and scratch them with their nails. When they see them at their 20-year class reunion, they hate each other's guts. I'm not sure why that is. Estrogen? Could be. I don't know. I'm just saying. But there are many areas in our life where, uh, send all your emails to Alex Demare at motionstaff.com. Um, whenever my wife gives me that look, I know I've crossed the line, but, you know, I'm 54. I'm okay. Um, there are a lot of different areas as it pertains to surrender that you might not be aware that it's my job to help make you be aware 
of the progression of surrender. Are you ready to learn something from God's word? Okay, uh, take out, if you're new, by the way, if you're new, welcome to Motion Church, right? Can we give those people a warm round of applause? Welcome, welcome. Hey, here's the first kind of surrender that I know to be true. The first kind of surrender is called minuscule surrender. Minuscule. Do you notice the root word of that word minuscule? Maybe. Maybe. A mean squirrel. Minuscule surrender. You see, minuscule surrender, we just, we just kind of do it because we know we have to. But it's not really in our heart, not really. Not really. But we just, you know, because all of us, by the way, all of us have a spirit. If you're a seeker of Jesus within the sound of my voice tonight on either of our campuses or online, can I just tell you, you are braided together in a helix, body, soul, spirit. And you have a spirit. And that spirit knows the difference between right and wrong. You see, contrary to the polls of public opinion, this word is very clear that there are moral absolutes in the universe because God has written them down to be so. Everybody doesn't get to decide for themselves what is right for themselves. I know that because you didn't create the universe or you, but there was one that did, and he gave us a, 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 a rule book, a game, bo a game book, a manual to follow on how to engage him called the Word of God. Now, now sometimes we have this minuscule surrender minuscule um have, and we know this is we know this is true in our human nature because we see it in children we see it in children do children have a natural proclivity to share <laughs> when our children were very small there was one of our uh, uh elders wives in our church who uh, taught my little daughter adrian this precious song and it goes like this Ten little fingers, ten little toes, two little ears and one little nose, two bright eyes that sparkle and shine, and one little mouth that says, Jesus is mine. Oh, isn't that a wonderful song? My four-year-old daughter only heard one word of the whole song. Mine! Mine! Would you like to share your Barbies? Mine! How about, would you like to share your shoes with your sister? Mine! And so, of course, because we're good parents, we taught her, <laughs> you will share or you will be locked in a closet until your 16th birthday. So, you know, it's up to you however you want to roll. <laughs> and so because, you know, the heavy hand of mom and dad came down, uh, Adrian begrudging, is she at the downtown campus tonight? Love you, sweetheart. Um, she, she had minuscule surrender when it came to sharing. You know, I like what Jesus said in Matthew's gospel when he's talking to the disciples in, in Matthew 16. And here's what he said. Then Jesus said to his disciples, if any of you want to be my follower, you must turn from your, say it. Say it out loud. Oh, you must turn from your selfish ways. Take up your cross and follow me. Now, here's something that we sometimes uh, forget in uh, a human history, that Jesus wasn't the only person ever to be crucified on a cross. And matter of fact, crucifixion wasn't invented for Jesus. It was something that the Roman Empire did as a deterrent uh, for crime. So quite literally, thousands and thousands and thousands of people were crucified every single year within the Roman Empire, particularly in Palestine. So this would have been an event that the disciples would have been very familiar with. They would have seen this happening on a frequent basis when people were literally forced to carry their cross up to Mount Golgotha where people were crucified. They would see the impaling process take place. But the brutalization was when they had to carry that cross on their shoulders after they had been whipped and scourged and they had to be humiliated, stripped naked, bleeding, and carry a cross through a crowded street. Now let this just resonate with you. Jesus said, if you're not willing to pick up your cross and follow me and turn from your selfish ways, you can't be my disciple. 
If you try to hang on to your life, what's going to happen? You're going to lose it. But if you get up, give up your life for my sake, you will save it. Now let's read verse 26 out loud together with conviction. Ready? Here we go. And what do you benefit if you gain the whole world but lose your own soul? Is anything worth more than your soul? Come on, people. There's this point of understanding that we have to understand. That's how long it lasts. Why are you working so hard for that? You see, Jesus has the benefit of perspective of eternity. We're locked into this three-dimensional world, and sometimes we just get locked. And so what do we surrender? Oh, this minuscule amount. Why? Because we have to. Now, going up the ladder of progression, something better than minuscule surrender is what I refer to as partial surrender. Partial surrender. This is when you know that you want to surrender to God. You want your quality of life to be high. You want to do what is the right thing, but there's a real commitment issue. When I played summer league basketball, um, I, was a, I was a freshman on my basketball team, and they had this thing called summer league. Now, what else happens in the summer? Vacations. Come on, parents, have you bumped up against that? Well, we'd like to take a vacation, but little Ralphie has to be 18,000 hours a week in soccer. Sorry, no vacation until he's 35. I mean, it's crazy town. And back in the day when I rolled out, this was no, there was no compulsory, hey, you got to do this thing. We had 16 guys on our basketball team. And we would be calling guys. Like, we had to drive from Coeur d'Alene to Spokane to go to Spokane Falls Community College where we would have our summer league games. And sometimes we would only have five dudes. Man, when you have five guys, it's kind of fun because you get a lot of shots. You, you, get a, you get a lot of playing time. But when it's in the fourth quarter and you're puking up blood because you're exhausted and you look to the bench and there's nobody there, it's like, come on, man. And this crazy thing about summer league was it was so rotational because, oh, we're on vacation. We're on vacation. Well, we can't make it. We're tired. Yeah, I have a date. Man, my car needs waxing. Man, I don't know. I have a hangnail. You know, and there's all these excuses why people would not be rolling out to summer league. So what the crazy thing was, when I got to be a senior, I called everyone together and said, vacation is officially over. And if you have any excuses of thinking you're not coming to Summer League, I will physically hurt you. So you just better figure it out. You're coming to Summer League, or I'll come with a bat, and you won't walk well. <laughs> it was awesome. 100% of participation. It was great. Aren't you glad that... People can find Jesus and have their character change. <laughs> you see, some of us, some of us uh, have more than minuscule, but we have partial. Well, I can't come to church because, you know, the hog at 10 o'clock kickoff, and I just can't make it. I want to be there so badly, but, you know, there's only 16 games in the season, and, man, when it's over, we got to deal with the Mariners, and, my God, what am I going to do? i got to be there for the 10 o'clock kickoff. Three little letters, D-B-R. Come on, somebody. Where do you spend your time? Where do you spend your money? I'll show you what you love. Do you love the house of God? Or do you love the house of you? I'm not calling you out. I'm calling you up. Come on now. Come on now. I'm telling the truth. I'm not stepping on toes. I'm being loving. If you're only locked into partial surrender, you're only going to have partial results. You know what happened my senior year? We didn't only win state. We won the state championship game by 38 points. We blew the next closest. We, we were undefeated the entire year. We went 24-0 and 0 state champs because we were committed to lifting, to gym time, to getting up 500 shots a day, to making 300 free throws a day, to dribbling with each hand for an hour a day. We were committed, and there was no partial this or that or the other. 
If you're only partial committed, you're going to get partial results. And you wonder why your faith is weak and you're discouraged and you're down. You can't get victory and you're like boo-hoo-hooing all over your poor little self. Just look at the level of your surrender. Now, I love you, but come on now. Come on. Number three, something a little better than partial surrender is what I refer to as general surrender. General surrender. Now, what is general surrender? Well, general surrender is, is something that is like you have a working understanding. This is called your maturity, by the way, of faith. When you get to general surrender, you got it. You know what you should do, but then sometimes you just don't do it, and then you get a little bit of a conviction because the Holy Spirit is speaking to you uh, <laughs> through your pastor. And then you make that correction. How many of you know it's way easier to push a, to drive a moving car than one that is not moving? You ever been broken down and like, oh God, power steering is out? This is going to be fun. General surrender is, is something that, that you have a good working knowledge. And by the way, you're never going to be 100% like, like perfect. You're not going to be perfect. You're not going to be perfect. You won't. But if you aim for mediocrity, you'll catch something less. If you aim for perfection, you'll catch excellence. You know what I'm aiming for? Perfection. I know I'm not going to catch it, but I'm aiming for it. My sights are bracketed in, man. I have that scope lasered in at 400 yards, and I'm going to hit that elk right in the heart and through the lungs. It's going down because I'm bracketed and la I'm lasered in. I'm aiming for perfection. But if I catch it high on the shoulders, I still got meat for the winter. You have general surrender, and that's a good thing because that tells you that you're moving in the right direction. Now, in 2 Kings chapter 13, I love this story in the Bible. There was a king that was very, very concerned about the enemy that was coming against him, and the enemy was superior to the king and his army and resources. But the prophet Elijah speaks to him. And here's what he says. He says, now pick up the other arrows and strike them against the ground. So the, king, the king's going like, okay, so let me get this right. In all of my regal robes, you want me to get down on my knees and bang the arrows against the ground. That doesn't seem very kingly to me. That, does seem, that doesn't seem very militaristic. That doesn't seem like a strategy that I could share with MIT or, 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 or some other kind of military school. What is the, up with that strategy of getting on my knees and banging in the ground with arrows? But you know what the king did? The king, the king was so respectful and reverent of Elijah. He so honored the fact that the man of God brought juice every time he talked that he had this general surrender so the king picked them up and struck the ground three times. Can you imagine this? Oh, I hope nobody's watching. Oh, where's the rest of my court? I did it. <laughs> Check the box. Look what the man of God said. You should have struck the ground five or six times. Then you would have beaten Aram until it was entirely destroyed. Now you will be victorious only three times. Do, do, do you sense the, do, do you get the conflict? Here's the king that couldn't reconcile and reason with his own faculties. Now, by the way, uh, you don't get to be king if you're stupid and dumb. If you have a very low IQ, uh, you'll be assassinated. Because <laughs> nobody wants a dumb king. So here's a pretty bright dude sitting on the throne, leading on the behalf of God, uh, probably running with about a buck 28 IQ. Uh, he, he could do, you know, basic calculus and, and trig, and he's, he's a bright dude. But he couldn't get past his own intellect. This seems foolish to me to get on my hands and knees and bang the ground with these arrows. I should be shooting them at folks, not banging them on the ground. But because he had general surrender, he complied Generally. I'm wondering in your own personal life, where do you comply generally with the Lord? 
Because now here's, here, here's the coup de grace. Here's the tippy tip tip top of what we're aiming for, and it's called total surrender. Total surrender. Total surrender. When I gave my life to Jesus at age 18, I got on my knees before the Lord and I said, God, if you never give me another thing the rest of my life, you've done enough for me. Thank you. Thank you. Within three days, my high school girlfriend broke up with me. Within three days, every friend that I had in my school of 2,200 students absolutely abandoned me. Within three days, my own father disowned me and told me never to speak to him again. And in my soul, you know what? I was good with it. I was I. I was I. Because here's what I knew. That the spirit of the living God that dwelt within me and filled that hole in the middle of my humanity, I attempted to fill with all the things of the world that never came close. And when Jesus came into my life, I said, Lord, all of me is you, yours. All, all of me is yours. Not just what I want. Not what I want, because what I want, it doesn't mean anything. It doesn't matter, because I am not, I had never picked up a Bible. I had never read a scripture verse. I had never been to church. I didn't know anything about it. That's why I read the Bible through to, and cover to cover five times within one calendar year, just so I can get a sense of what this thing was that I was getting into. And the more I read it, the more it became alive to me. And the more it became alive to me, the more I died to myself. The more I died to myself, the greater I lived for him. Do you understand? It takes total commitment to make a marriage work. Can you imagine m marriage vows like this? To love and to cherish, keeping yourself only to her pretty much the best you can as long as you both shall live. It's kind of quiet here on South Hill. I wonder if there's like... Uh, is that hitting downtown too? Yeah. Yeah, that wouldn't work. You see, it takes total surrender. Listen to the words of Jesus. In Matthew 26, verse 39. You see, Jesus is about ready to be crucified. <clears throat> he is absolutely devastated. Matter of fact, there's a condition called... Um, uh, I can't remember the name of the term now. Um, hemohydrosis. Hem hemohydrosis. That's when the, the corpuscles of your sweat glands literally open up and you start sweating drops of blood. Now, this is a scientific condition, hemohydrosis, that, that and, and this happens when people under incredible duress begin to perspire and, they're, and they're, the hemoglobin, the blood in their, on their forehead comes through their sweat glands and they begin to sweat drops of blood. I've been under incredible duress. I've never done that. I've never been, I've never paid that price yet. But Jesus is about ready to be crucified. And because he's God and he's man, he knows what's coming around the corner when the sun comes up. He knows that he's going to be handed over to the, to the Romans. He knows he's going to be brutalized, humiliated, stripped naked, beaten. He's going to have a crown of thorns on his head. He's going to be ridiculed and spat upon. His beard Hello, Alex Fox. His beard is going to be ripped out of his face. He's going to be impaled on a cross and suffocate to death over a six-hour time span. He knows what's coming. Listen to the words of Jesus. He went a little farther beyond them, and he fell on his face and praying, Father, Daddy, 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 if it's possible, if it's possible, let this cup pass from me. What's he saying? Daddy, I don't want to do this. I don't, I don't want to go through this. I don't want to be beaten. I don't want to be crucified. I don't want to have a crown of thorns. I don't want to be shamed and humiliated. I don't want to go through, through sleep deprivation. I don't want to hang between heaven and earth and be ridiculed. I don't want to do it. That's what Jesus is saying when he says, let this cup pass from me. I don't want to do this. Yet not as I will, but as you will. Do 
1945, at the end of World War II, the Japanese Air Force knew that the war was nearly lost. And so they gave one last gasp effort. And they came up with something called kamikaze. Now, the, the word kamikaze is a compound word. Kamai, meaning uh, breath or spirit, and kazi of God. Kamikaze, breath of God. They believed themselves, errantly so, to be on a mission from God. After they have dropped all of their bombs on United States vessels, to not let those planes come back ever to the tarmac, but to fly those planes right into the deck of United States ships. There's a story of a 22-year-old kamikaze pilot. He ascended to the top of his class. He wrote it in his memoirs and his narratives. This is my last flight. No matter how it turns, I will fly my plane directly into the deck of the USS Bunker Hill, and it will stink, and I will die in glory because I am a breath of God. Can you imagine leaving the tarmac that day, flying over your target, dropping your bombs, and then flying your plane directly into the deck? That's called total surrender. You see, I want to be kamikaze for God. You want my money? Take it. You want my life? Take it. You want my house? Take it. You want my friends? Take it. You want my dignity? Take it. You want my pride? Take it. See, only when we come to total surrender, total surrender, we begin to walk a life of, in this, of the Spirit as a son and a daughter of the Most High God. Now that's the high bar, okay? You're not going to get there in a day. Give yourself a little bit of room. Are you minuscule? Are you partial? Are you general? Or are you total? My heart for us at Motion Church is that we become totally surrendered in every avenue of our life. Every avenue of our life. I want to invite you would to bow your head and close your eyes before the Lord. <clears throat> hey, if it was about being good enough, Jesus never would have had to come to the earth and die a brutal death. It's not about being good enough. Not. Never has been, never will be. So what's it about, Pastor? Well, here's what it's about. It's about admitting the fact that you need to give your life to God and have him live inside of you. See, Jesus said, Behold, I stand at the door and knock, and if anyone would open up their heart and let me come in, I will live inside of them. Can you imagine advantage you of God going beside to inside? Wow. That is something I can't even imagine. The Spirit of the living God is moving in and out of the seats of our downtown campus. I know because I've been praying over them. The Spirit of the living God is moving in and out of the seats of the South Hill campus. I know because I've been praying over them. The Spirit of the living God is moving over the World Wide Web. I know I've been asking God for people to catch this word. Because if we could dare catch this word, it would change our lives forever. So my first question is this. Does Jesus live beside you? or inside you. If Jesus lives beside you, you run the risk of missing heaven by 18 inches. The distance from your head to your heart. Wouldn't it be a great, joyous beginning of the holiday season for you to give yourself the greatest gift of all? That's the inhabitation of God. So in a moment, you're going to hear the word now. When I say now, that's my invitation for you to lift up your hand and say, Pastor, here's my hand. Please pray for me. I want Jesus to come into my heart. Come on now. Come on now. Life's a vapor. It's a mist. It's a mist. 
and you're on this point of human history. You've come to this setting downtown and up here on the hill and online for God to come into your heart. I pray you make that move when you hear that word now. Here it comes. That word now from the front to the back, from the side to the side. And now it's coming in three, in two, in one. Right now, put your hand high into the air and say, Pastor, here I am. Oh, come on. And can you welcome people that are giving their life to Jesus? Welcome, welcome. Seriously, welcome to the family of God. Welcome. Ha <laughs> ha. The devil just lost souls he thought he had. Let's pray this out loud together, shall we? Say, dear Lord Jesus, come on, everyone, say, dear Lord Jesus, come into my heart. Forgive me of my sin. Wash me. Cleanse me. I thank you that my past is forgiven. So my future is bright before me. I am a, a member of the family of God. With your heads bowed and eyes closed, I'm wondering, did the Holy Spirit prick your conscience about your degree of surrender? Is there a certain area in your life where you're like, oh, I've, uh, that's not totally surrendered to God? If you desire that total surrender, here's what I want you to do. Take your hands right now and just place them over your heart. I, not, I want you to pray this with me. Say, Dear Lord Jesus, you see where I'm not surrendered. And I want to be. I want to be like you. Help me now to surrender that which I have not. Let me be an authentic, an authentic child of God, completely surrendered. Let me become a kazi the breath of God to my world in which I live. In Jesus' name, amen. Can we stand to our feet on both of our campuses? Our worship teams are gonna ring us out with the song. Can you just lift up your hands to the Lord? Come on, and let's just begin to worship Him with our spirit.